The Bible is pretty clear on how we, as followers of Christ, show our faith through how we treat the most vulnerable among us. In James 1, we see a very specific example for us regarding widows and orphans. Let me paint you a quick picture with some numbers. Approximately 400,000 children in the U.S. are in foster care, and of that 400,000, about 20,000 of those children are in the Illinois system. Every two minutes, a child is removed from their home and placed in foster care. Over 50% of foster families quit fostering within the first year. More than 70% of children with siblings are separated from one or more of them while in care. 40% of youth leaving the foster care system will be homeless within 18 months. This is the problem, but each of us has the opportunity to be part of the solution. These numbers are staggering, depressing, and bleak, but there are so many ways we can have a positive impact in the lives of these children in addition to foster. At each of our campuses, there are local partners present that support children and youth in vulnerable situations, as well as families seeking to offer the best care possible. These partners are waiting to have a conversation with you today on how you can make an impact. Today's inspiring story is guest grew up in the foster care system, placed in a total of 12 different homes. Now, she is a leading advocate in foster care, the best-selling author of the memoir, Foster, and founder of the Beloved Initiative, which seeks to change the narrative in foster care and make a bold statement to those children, I love you already. Please welcome to the stage, Tori Hope Peterson. Tori, it is great to have you with us, and uh, welcome to those of you who are watching online or are at one of our five campuses. So DeKalb, shout out to you guys, and Hundley. Streamwood down in Aurora and in St. Charles, South Elgin. You guys are in for a treat. Now, there's a very traumatic side to your story, but before we get to that, I just want to start with something kind of fun. Uh, you won a Mrs. Universe competition. So tell us how you even ended up in something like that. So Mrs. means that you're married. That's that category. Okay. And, you know, I, I was... My husband and I were fostering a sibling group of three. We had five kids, three and under, and I was waking up every morning. You know when you're a mom, you're just like living in your mom's sweats, your mom messy bun. And uh, someone presented the opportunity of pageantry to me, and I thought, that sounds kind of fun. I had been speaking for about a year, and a large part of the competition was interview and speaking. And so... Um, it resulted in Mrs. Universe. <laughs> so, so there's some, they judge it on speaking, on personality, on... Yeah, and then there's, of course, the beauty aspect to okay. it, and you have to have a nice dress, and all the more superficial things. Okay, okay. And by the way, I don't identify at all with the mom bun and the, all, the, all the other stuff. This yeah, you're yet. lucky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah well, that's, that is a, that's a pretty cool honor. Now, let's start at the beginning of your story because the fact that it could end up at Mrs. Universe is pretty cool. But it starts with your mom becoming pregnant with you, and it was, you know, it was a bit of a sketchy pregnancy. Uh, wasn't sure who the dad was. Uh, she had tested positive for HIV. I'm guessing there must have been some people in her life who were suggesting she should abort and not give, give birth to this child. So, yeah, tell us, give us a little more background. Yeah, when I was nine years old, my mom told me that I was conceived out of abuse. Both of her parents had passed away before she was born. She had very little support. And I think that, you know, there are plenty of people that told, could have told her she had all the right to abort. But my mom was actually in jail when she was pregnant with me. And what they did was they gave her an ultrasound. And uh, she said when she heard my heartbeat and when she, she said that my hands were laying under my face and she said yeah. when she saw me on the ultrasound, she knew that's my baby. And she also had people to encourage her. She said that someone sent her a letter while she was in jail yeah. and uh, had the scripture Jeremiah 29, 11 on it. And so she prayed that my life would be full of hope and uh, she was diagnosed with HIV um, and so she also prayed that even if she didn't have victory, that the baby would have victory, uh, which is where my name comes from, Victoria Hope. Yes. Um, and then when I was born, I was born HIV free. And then my mom um, actually tested negative for HIV as wow. well. Wow. Wow. Cool. God answered that prayer big time. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> 
You know, just, just a word about that. We work with, uh, with a number of crisis pregnancy centers. It's amazing what an ultrasound yes. machine does in helping a woman to see that what's inside of her is not just a massive tissue. Yeah. It's a baby. Yeah. It's a little human being. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's pretty cool. Mm. So uh, early on, though, you end up in the foster care system. And in fact, you've written a book. Um, I, I've read this book cover to cover. It's a really, really good book. We're selling it across our, our five campuses, Fostered. Uh, whether you're personally interested in fostering or you know somebody, uh, who has grown up in a foster home or fostering kids. Just a, a wonderful story of God's redemption. And uh, so in this story, you tell about how you got started. I mean, you, you eventually ended up in 12 different foster homes, but what, what was the first home like? How did you end up there to begin with? So there were uniformed men that busted through our front door, and it was a drug bust. They started taking drugs down from the wardrobe and the places where my mom and her boyfriend hid them. And then there was a nice woman. She came and swooped me up off the floor, took me to the backyard, to my swing set, started pushing me and said, we're going to go somewhere for a little while. And I sat on a metal floor of the SWAT truck on my way to my first foster home. And in that first foster home, I wanted to go back with my biological mom. Yeah. You know, I think when you're four or five, you do not have any perception that the things that your parents are doing are bad. I don't know if a child, I mean, I just loved my mom. And I would say that my mom also genuinely loved me. My mom is a, her as my mother is a really complex situation. She's a complex person. She always said that she loved me. She didn't have the resources that I had. And I think she tried her best with yeah. what she had. Um, but her way of making money was not safe. And so even though I wanted to go back, I stayed in the foster care system in, in that home for about six months, she says. You know, you also don't have like an interpretation of time at that yeah. age. Yeah, sure. Um, but my mom, one of the roles of the foster care system is reunification. And so my mom worked her case plan and I was reunified with my mom. But in that foster home, one of the reasons I wanted to go back with my biological mom um, was because my foster mom was kind of mean. Um, we know that when a child moves home or has any big change, something that can happen, a trauma response is actually bedwetting. And so I started to wet the bed for like the first time ever. And um, she would have my foster mom every morning, if she would see it, she'd make me wash out my underwear in the toilet. And I think that that perpetuated the issue because it only got worse. Sure. And then there was one morning, I don't know if my foster mom wasn't home, I'm not sure where she was, but we, I was in a room with other women, and, or like girls, and there was one girl, she seemed older, like maybe 15 or 16, and um, she saw that I'd wet the bed, she took my, she said, she was like, it's okay, she took my sheets, and she just like helped me get cleaned up. And you know, I just go and play. And then I came back and my bed was made and it was dry. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And after that, I had never wet the bed again. Yeah. And what she did, we know that when it comes to healing trauma, there are different modalities to do it. You can use medication, you can do different modalities of therapy. But the number one most efficient way to heal trauma in our bodies and in our brains is to have experiences that directly contradict the traumatic sure, experience. Sure. And so I think that's what she did. She contradicted yeah. the traumatic experience. Yeah. Well, one person showing love mm -hmm. in that situation goes yeah. a long way, doesn't it? Talk to us for a few moments about the foster care system um, in this country. My, my daughter, Emily, is a child welfare advocate in, in Oregon, and I know how broken this, this system is. You know, how many kids are involved in foster care? Uh, what's the goal? What, what, what do they hope to accomplish in foster care? Yeah, so I say that the goal of foster care is to make families whole, whether that's through reunification, adoption, kinship, um, or a long-term stay, which especially happens for older youth. I think the foster care system would say that their goal right now is reunification. It's very yeah. trendy that um, reunification is the priority. But I do think we're doing kids a disservice and an injustice if we say that all biological families are safe to return to, just like we would if we didn't um, vet our foster homes and yes. say that yes. any foster parents are safe to go right. to. Go to. Right. Um, so the goal of foster care, I definitely think, 
changes when our culture changes. But I think the heart of foster care should be to make families whole. The system is broken. There's 400,000 kids in the foster care system, about 120,000 kids waiting to be adopted right now. A lot of those are older youth. A lot of people go into the foster care system, become foster parents to take yes. in younger kids, to adopt younger kids. Yeah. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of older kids waiting and uh, 60 to 70% of human trafficking victims are actually directly involved with the child welfare system. And that's because those teenagers who are waiting to be adopted, yes. it's difficult to find them homes. Yeah. Inappropriate yeah. sometimes yeah. to put them in group homes because they don't have the behaviors for that. And so they end up in hotels, um, which is a very vulnerable sa- situation for but, trafficking. You know, it, exactly. That's what's going on with my daughter right now. Yeah. So uh, she's got a 10 eight and four-year-old of her own, but she spends one or two nights a week in a hotel in an adjacent room to a foster teen. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, sometimes they run during the night and then she spends her night in the back of a police car going around town looking for that, you know, that foster child on the run. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a messed up, messed up system and and a place where Christ followers can make a difference. So we're we're, going to come back to that a little bit later. You ended up back with your mom. So is that, is that a good idea? I mean, a moment ago you were saying that that's the trendy thing to do. Mm-hmm. And I've talked to, I've talked to foster parents who are heartbroken when they have to give a child back yeah. up to a home where they know it's not a good situation. So yeah. in your, in your situation, was that, was that good? Going yeah, back I, to your mom? I should probably watch my mouth a little bit. It's a trendy thing to do. It is also research shows that children even when compared to children who are in the foster care system and children who live in maybe some a more dysfunctional home, yeah. uh, but they're living with their biological family, it actually tends to be better than living in the foster care system. Um, because we know, right, God's original, and that makes total sense. You know, God's original design is for us to be with our family. Yeah. Um, so it's trendy. It's also good. Um, and I think that my mom... Like biological parents have to work what's called a case plan to usually get their children back out of the foster care system. And my mom works that pretty faithfully. Um, she wanted me back. Um, she she just did everything that she they told her to do that she possibly could um, to have me back. Was that a, a totally safe environment for you? So when I first went back home, I do think that things were relatively stable. Things were relatively safe, but as my mom got older, as time went on, my mom's mental illness got significantly worse. She was diagnosed with bipolar and schizophrenia. And as time went on, um, I think her mental health just kind of started to take a toll on her. And that's when things started to get unsafe. The physical abuse, the hitting, um, just the hurt started to wow. increase in our home. Wow. So, so Tori, you're, you are a biracial young woman. Did that impact your sense you know, of identity growing up? Did it impact how you were treated in the foster care system? Did... Yeah, I think my racial identity has always been something that I have been trying to understand myself because growing up, so I was a little blonde baby. My daughter, my <laughs> two-year-old daughter is blonde and people are like, where does she get her blonde hair from? Because my husband has brown hair, I have brown hair. And I'm like, well, actually, it's from me because I had blonde hair for a really long time. I had really light skin. And so my mom, she actually always told me that I was white. She told me I was Caucasian. And then as I started to get older, my peers started to say, like, what do you mix with? What's your ethnicity? And I was always like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then I went to my mom. And I was like, mom, what are these people talking about? Like, what is my ethnicity? And she's like, you're Caucasian. You're Caucasian. She was very ashamed that I was black. Um, And then she also made up some races that I was to try and just anything to not tell me that I was African-American. And um, it was just very, I think my racial identity to me has always been a a complex, complex thing to understand. Yeah. Yeah. So where do you get your identity from? Now I get my identity (laughs) from Christ. And I do think that I feel like when I came to Christ, The identity that I really identified with was orphan, alone, abandoned, unwanted. And so then when I came to know Christ, it was like, he's my father. He loves me. He wants me. And there was like no other identity in the way for me to just like 
put that on. Sure, yeah. D- did, that, did that impact that tension? Did it impact how you were treated in foster care? Yeah, I didn't know that when I was in the system, but now that my husband and I are foster parents and we're very involved with the foster care community in our town, you know, some of the caseworkers that were caseworkers when I was a kid are caseworkers now, which can be a bit awkward, but there's one that we've um, established a pretty good relationship with who was my caseworker, and um, she's actually told me that one of the reasons it was so hard for them to find me homes was because I was biracial. Um, And I would have never known, you know, when I was a kid, but she said it was a huge barrier for them. And that really did surprise me. Wow. Wow. So you, um, you went through a dozen different homes. So like, were you a problem chat? Were you a brat? Yes, very much. Yeah. Yeah. Really big problem. (laughs) (laughs) So how, how did that happen? Did you ended up in so many homes? There's a lot of reasons kids move. Um, of course, I did break some rules, okay? That was one of the reasons okay. I moved. I was a little bit rebellious. But, um, like I said, a lot of people go into the foster care system wanting to be foster parents because they want to adopt little ones. So I was decent at track, and for that reason, I was a bit well-known. And we, I, I'm from a very small rural community in Ohio. Okay. Um, and so I was pretty well known because of my track career. And so when people would get a call for me, there was some interest because it was like, okay, well, we know she's that good athlete. We know she gets good grades. We see her kind of in the community as a relatively good kid and a good athlete, which I think was appealing to people. And so people would say yes to me. They typically let me in their home. Um, but then if there was little kids, a placement that would come uh, that, especially where they were adoptable, because I was considered unadoptable. Uh-huh. Um, I would kind of move to the next home so that that family could establish themselves, I sure, think, as an adoptive, sure. more as an adoptive family. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the things that did make me feel very unwanted, very unloved, because uh, it felt like I was kind of second to kids who were younger than me or other children who were considered adoptable. Um, and I moved because, you know, some foster homes were abusive, um, not to me, but to other children in their home. And so um, everybody is pulled out then? Is that it? Um, it depends yes. on, on the placement. So like okay. if in a foster home, if, the, if there's adoptive kids or there's biological kids, depending on the degree of abuse, sometimes yeah. they will let those children stay in there. But if it's, usually they pull all the foster yes. children out. Yeah, yeah. I got to tell you, your book wrecked me at places because I'm, I'm cheering for you as I'm reading, you know, through, and you get adopted by a new home, and it's looking good, and oh yeah, this is finally the right. Oh nope, she ended up, you know, getting canned from that yeah. place as I, well. I felt so, the same way like, when you when you wrote it. it. Yeah. yeah, well, when, when I when it. I wrote it, and then when I was living it, I was like, this is the one, and then I was like, oh, okay. Wow. Wow. So, how does that mess with your view of God? So, what was your view of of God back then, as you're getting? Back and forth, seesawed between, now you're back home with mom, she's getting increasingly, her mental health is, is problematic, so you're back in a foster care home, that doesn't last, back with mom. Back. What are you thinking about God through all this? I was very mad at God, I did not want anything to do with him. We were actually reading an Ayn Rand book in high school, why we were reading an Ayn Rand book in my public school, I have no idea. But uh, her philosophy uh, promotes atheism. And I think I grasped onto that because it gave me some kind of answer that I thought was right. And then in my 11th foster home, but with that grasping onto that, I still had her, what her philosophy did, understanding philosophy, is that I started to raise a lot of questions about God. And in my 11th foster home, I had foster parents who were taking me to church. We were doing devotions at the dinner table and I would have questions and they would try their best to answer them. Sure. And I think that's when my heart started to be drawn to him more than ever. I liked the character of Jesus. He was loving. He was sacrificial. And I think I understood that maybe he could love me, which seemed impossible from when I looked at all the other people around me. Yeah. But then my foster parents in my 11th home, they abused their adoptive kids. And so I was very confused wow. because I was understanding that Jesus was love. God yeah. was love. Yeah. Um, but then my foster parents were contradicting that. 
Um, and they were just like a juxtaposed to who I was learning God yeah. was um, and what I thought his people should look like. Yeah. So at that point, that was when I really started. I remember going to school and uh, there's like the city school in our town and then there's a country school and the country school um, is definitely more traditional. Um, like faith, even though it's a public school, is something that's talked about uh, pretty normally. And most of the kids that go there, faith is definitely a part of like their family life. And I remember like trying to convince other kids that like God was not real. He couldn't be real because I had suffered, I had struggled. And there were other kids that were way more innocent than me that had suffered. And how could God be so good if we have endured so much pain? So your first blush, I mean, I want, I want to make sure I, I get this right. Your first blush with Christian faith and whatever is with a family that, that doesn't live it. And Let that, me, that would mess with, with your head. Yeah, and I feel like maybe I should rewind a little bit because God was always there throughout my story. Like I, I do see that. I went to a juvenile detention center when I was 12 years old for a domestic violence against my mom while she was abusing me. Um, And I remember reading, so when you, in the juvenile detention center, when you uh, do something that you're not supposed to do, or they they do like roll call where they bang on the doors and you're supposed to stand up. And I didn't hear that we were supposed to be doing roll call. So I was laying down. um, And if you don't stand up, then you get your mattress and like any extra books in your cell taken out. And so they took out everything. The only thing that I was allowed to have was my Bible. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to read this thing. And so I opened it up and I remember thinking, look at Paul in jail, and I'm in jail, so I must be like Paul. And, so, and then I took it out to the girls when we had like our, our like more congregate time, and I'd be like, guys, we're like Paul. And I would encourage the girls with scripture. So like, Jesus was always there throughout my life. Yeah. Um, he was always encouraging me if I would just open myself up to him. But then... I always wanted to keep him at a, you know, arm's distance. Yeah, yeah. So you get into high school, uh, you discover you're fast, you end up on the track and field team with a wonderful coach. I mean, you just got to tell us some of that background and how God used that to bring some healing into your life. I was okay at track in high school. Like I said, I'm from a small rural town in Ohio. So I was the fastest girl on my team in a small rural town in Ohio. We all know what that means, okay? (laughs) And my track coach, in between my junior and senior year, so I never went to the state track meet in an individual race. Um, Usually, if you want to do something big at state, then maybe your first year you go and you are in semifinals. Then your second year, you make it to finals and you place low. Your third year, you place higher. And then like maybe your fourth year, you win it. But I never even been. But my track coach, he was like, Tori, I think you can go on to the state track meet. This was in between my junior and senior year. The summer we were training together. And I just trained really because I was always trying to get out of the house. I was always trying to get away from my foster family. I didn't have necessarily like these big grand goals. Um, I wanted to go to college, didn't know if I was going to run in college though, but he said, I think you can go on to the state track meet and I think you can win it. And that, what that did, that goal, it gave me a very tangible vision that I really never had before. I heard the narrative in my community that I was a bad kid. People didn't really want anything to do with me, like set some distance from that girl. She's trouble. And there was another narrative from my church and people were like, she's anointed, she's gifted. But when you don't grow up in the church, you don't have a language for that. I didn't know what that meant. It really meant nothing to me. And I'm I'm thankful for it now. Um, Those things are encouragement to me now. But when I was that age, it really meant nothing. And so when my track coach gave me this tangible vision goal, I could see it. And I thought, okay, I can work towards that. But he had a caveat and he was like, if you do everything I say. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna do everything this crazy old man says. And if it doesn't work out, then we're just gonna blame him. (laughs) So I trained with him for that year. We became very close. He was, I was living with, uh, moved to my 12th foster home, which was a single foster mom who was amazing. I loved her, love her so much. And um, she was just reflecting the love of Jesus to me in so many ways, taking me to practice, um, sitting there with me for hours while I trained with my coach. And 
even though she, she was amazing, but she was a single foster mom. So now I have a, a father figure, and he really filled that role. Like, I felt like God really planned it perfectly yeah. so that I could have her have a father figure, and he was just there with me. I chose to emancipate out of the foster care system the day I turned 18 because I felt pretty burned by the system, so I was like, peace out. And when, I, when you're in the foster care system, rules have changed a little bit now, but I couldn't get a driver's license. So my track coach was driving me to and from track practice. And when he was driving me home, um, I was just looking out the window and he was like, Tori, talk to my daughters and we would like to invite you into our family. We'd like to welcome you into our home. And that year under his training, um, with him being a part but being a part of his family, I became a four-time state champion in track and field. Wow, wow, fantastic. <laughs> okay, so, so take us to the point where you surrender your life to Christ. Be, because, you know, you've been painting this picture, ups and downs. Mm-hmm. You're getting a little glimpse of Christianity, but then it's not lived consistently. Um, you know, you're you're appealed to by the character of Christ who seems loving and sacrificial, yeah. but then why is God allowing all this crud in my life? Yeah. So, so it's going back and forth. Back. You know, at what point do you say, okay, I'm, I'm in. Jesus, I want you to be the, the savior, the king of my life. Yeah, I felt like for a long time, I needed all my questions answered. I was like, I need all my questions answered. Yeah. So I, I just had, I say that it was like skepticism, like scales of skepticism over my eyes and I needed those to be taken off. Yeah. And so my question about suffering as my foster mom was taking me to church um, day in, day out, really, she was so involved. We were involved like in a Christmas play and you know, I would sit with people and they would, so almost everyone in my church was involved in the foster care system. And so they knew how to like interact with me. Wow. They were so loving, so kind. Um, and this was like people, people in leadership, you know, they were either foster parents, they were involved in ministries, had started a nonprofit to help kids in foster care. Our church was very involved. And so, you know, people would sit just alongside of me and talk to me and show me like genuine care when my foster mom was doing the Christmas play practice. Um, and then, you know, we'd go to church on Wednesday and Sunday. She was so faithful. And I think through that, my questions were being answered. So my question about suffering, you know, I understood that Jesus suffered. And in his suffering, there was great glory. It was a great act of love for us. He came down, lived a human life, and died on the cross so that we would be forgiven of our sins and so that we would know his love for us. And so the answer to why do I, why have I went through so much suffering? Why have other kids went through so much suffering? was that like our suffering isn't wasted. In our suffering, God can be mightily glorified, especially if we're meant to live our lives as a reflection of Christ. And then my other question was, well, why didn't God give me a dad? Because maybe if Mm -hmm. I would have had a dad, then I would have had someone who could have taken me out of the foster care system. Maybe I wouldn't have went in in the first place or someone to protect me when I was being hit and abused. And I was singing the song, Good, Good Father, at my church and um, it just kind of clicked during that time. I realized like, oh God is my father. He's the father I've been looking for. He's the one that fills all these gaps and he's better than any earthly father ever even could be. And he loves me and he cares for me as his daughter. And I think my identity really when I understood like, oh, I'm his daughter. Yeah. really started started to shift. So was it, a, was it a point in time when you surrendered? Was it, a, it kind of happened over uh, days or, or weeks? Yeah, I would say it definitely happened over, like over time. Um, it was just like, like I said, these scales of skepticism being um, pulled, you know, from my eyes. I will say there were times when my church, you know, would invite us to, to know Christ. And I always wanted to go up, but I always thought, they're just making us skeptical of this. They're making a big deal about this. And it's so funny, because now I know as a believer why we do that. I know it's because like, this is a family. 
And I'm like, I didn't have a family. And there's so many people that maybe they have a biological family, but they feel displaced one way or another. And what the church is trying to do, they're trying to say, you're a part of us now and we need to know you. We need to celebrate that you are a child of God. But I thought like, they're making a big deal out of this. I can't do this. I can't go up there. And like till this day, sometimes I, I wish, you know, that I would have had that moment so that I could remember. Yeah. But I just remember that there was such a heart change in me watching all these people at my church love so radically because they were so involved in foster care. And I thought when I looked at them, I thought if they care about kids like me, then maybe God cares about me. And that love that they had that was so radical, I wanted it. I was a bully in high school. I was angry. I was upset. I didn't want to be. I wanted to portray the kind of love that they portrayed, but I knew I could only do that if like the God of love was living inside of me. Yeah. You you say something about church in your book. I I just, I want to quote this. Obviously, I have a vested interest in church. I'm, you know, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of into church myself. But you, you say, mom and I are similar. Your mom, mm-hmm. who was sometimes abusive and mm-hmm. had all her problems. But I believe the greatest difference between us is that I have the church and yeah. she doesn't. So again, tell us, what difference does church make? And listen real carefully, okay? <laughs> what? My mom... My mom has so many strengths. I can't emphasize that enough. She is the reason I know hard work. She is the reason that I value achievement and accomplishments, which sometimes cannot be good, but it, it can be good. And she taught me those things. Um, she taught me how to have grit, um, how to be strong. Me and my mom are a lot alike. She wanted to love me. I want to love my kids so well. You know, we had the same intentions, yet for some reason, Hers fell short. And I think that is because what I have that she didn't have is a strong, strong, but also a community that like values holy things. When you have a community that values holy things, what happens is when you need a babysitter, when my mom would put me with her friends, with babysitters, and I was not in a safe place. Like, yeah, I remember yeah. there was this one time my mom put me with one of her friends and she was an alcoholic and she was like passed out the whole time and her kids like tortured me while I was supposed to be being babysat. That will never happen to my children because I am in a strong community that loves children. I, when yeah. I need something, when I am low or when the trauma comes back or when little lies come back and whisper. I have a church that reminds me of who I am in Christ. I have a community that wraps around me, that comes to my home, that loves me. And like, I know people will be like, okay, wait, I'm going to church and I don't have that. That's because you guys have to show up for one another. You have to verbalize what you need and you have to be vulnerable. And when we do that in church, in community, it changes everything. Yeah. So let's hear it for church. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. You know, seriously, there, you know, there are more and more articles written. You'll see it in the news. The de-churching of America. There's, there is a definite trend. We're moving away from mm-hmm. the close-knit community of brothers and sisters in Christ or people are watching online but not showing up ever in person and we, we need each other. Yeah, we and need I, each other. I hear from so many people who do that. Well, the church has just hurt me. The, the big C church has not hurt you. A few broken people in their brokenness have hurt you and you have also hurt people in their brokenness yeah. and you have needed people to continue to show up for you in your brokenness. So people need you to continue to show up for them and how we establish a good, beautiful, flourishing church is to keep showing up when it hurts. Yeah, preach it, sister. Yeah. Woo. I love the church. Okay. I love the church. Yeah. Okay. So you find Jesus, you surrender your life to him, you go off to college, you meet this dude, you fall in love, tell us about Jacob. You know, how did you guys meet and, and what did you see in each other that attracted you to one another? He was here last night and I wish he was here. I wanted him to sleep in with the kids this morning. But if you saw him, you would know why I'm attracted to him. He's beautiful. (laughs) He was kind. He was very smart. Um, Came from a very stable background. He was a pastor's kid. Grew up with four siblings. Mom homeschooled him throughout their entire upbringing. And I love that. I love that kind of close-knit family. Um, And then he had this... 
he, he actually showed me his favorite sermon within like a week or two of dating. And it was Bob Goff um, that said, love God, love people, do stuff. And I thought, that's like also my six word quote for life. I just didn't know it. So let's do that together. Oh, wow, well, well. So, you know, let, let me give you a high inside fastball here. So, I've, you know, I read your book. You guys start dating, you get pregnant. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, ah, oh, you, you know, God's kind of delivered you from some promiscuity in mm-hmm. your past. And now you find a good relationship. And, you know, what happened? What happened there? You know, we can know God, I think, and we can try our best to walk with him. And there are still messy parts that we have to yeah. figure out. And I think one of the things I just could not believe was my worth and my value. I didn't understand that like my body should be honored, that I as God's child really did have value. And I think yeah. that obviously comes from, from trauma, um, but that is just a truth that I really struggled to walk out. And I think that was promiscuity was the result of that. I also think that when I came to the Lord, I really came to him understanding that I was his daughter. He was my father. I'd heard the message that I was sinful and in need of a savior. However, I had never quite under, like wrapped my head around my sin, how detrimental it was, um, how much it broke God's heart. And so I actually got my dream job out of college to go work for um, a Christian ranch, children's home um, out in Alabama. And when I went and visited, I just remember them, they just grabbed each other's hands and they started praying for these kids. Like I never heard foster parents, caregivers pray for kids in this way. And I went to like a good church that cared about kids in foster care. And I mean, I was just so moved. And I was like, I feel like this is where God wants me to heal. Because I knew that I, I still had issues. And I knew that I needed to be in a place where I could heal that. Yeah. And so I got this job of living with um, girls transitioning out of foster care into adulthood. And I was going to kind of be like their RA and help them. And I was so, so excited. And when I got pregnant, I lost that job. And there are some, I know there are some Christians who are like, whoa, like the church was supposed to support her. Like that was a Christian organization. But I was supposed to live with the girls. I can't have my husband living with the girls. It's just like safety stuff. I totally understood it. It was the right move. And I actually believe it was the right move because what I needed to understand and learn, I think what God wanted to teach me was that like my sin that, that breaks his heart should also break my heart. And there yeah. are consequences to not obeying God's word and not yeah. obeying him. And I never really had that as a follower of yes. Jesus yes. until then. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you what, what I really appreciate in your book, your honesty at that point of saying, yeah, I was wrong. And, uh, you know, I needed to be forgiven for that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, uh, you know, your acceptance of God's grace and walking through it and, you know, God pulling you out the other side. And by the, by the way, if I, could, if I could put in a uh, promotion for one of the announcements you heard this weekend, this coming, uh, is it Friday or Saturday? I forget. You'll have to look at your, uh, it's Friday. Thank you. All right. How did you know what I was going to say? <laughs> you have no idea what I, uh, Okay. So we, we've got this, <laughs> this parent pathway thing on sexuality and gender. And I would just say to you, moms and dads, if you've got teens and you're not signed up for that, come on, really? Yeah. There's like, what, what bigger issue in the life of your kids right now than gender and sexuality? Do you, you want to hear what God has to say from a biblical standpoint? Do you want help? Uh, we're offering it. But mm-hmm. you gotta, you got to sign up. you got to be there. So please take advantage of it. This is a really tricky area to navigate. And as you come to Christ and you want to follow him, uh, you know, it could sometimes be a three steps forward, two steps back yeah. because of the, the mistakes yeah. that, that, that we make. Yeah. So as, as we move toward a conclusion here, I, you know, I want people to hear from you if they're Christ followers, if this is their church, uh, why should they be involved to some extent in foster world, okay? Uh, you know, what's the difference that we could make? Uh, what are some of the ways that we could participate in bringing healing to people like you? Yeah, James one twenty seven is the scripture that says, pure and faultless religion is caring for the orphan and the widow. And so in a sense, it's a calling, but 
when we read that scripture, that's the end of chapter one. So we're like, whoa, there's not any instruction here. Um, I love that you guys have the how to read the Bible classes. I've never seen a church do that. I wish I would have had that when I was coming into the church. But something that I I learned in undergrad is that those headings, those like big numbers, we can take those out. Those weren't put in by the original authors. And so when we ask ourselves, like, what is the instruction here? You keep reading chapter two. What it says is when a poor man comes into your home, put him in the same place that you would the rich man. Do not put the one without at your feet, put him at the same place. So when a child or a man or a woman comes into our home that doesn't have as much as we have, put them in the same place. It's a call. We have instruction for it. It's what God calls us to do. And like Jesus just cares. Like we know that Jesus cares for children. Jesus cares for the lost. Jesus cares for the lonely. He cares for the abandoned. He leaves the 99. He goes for the one. And if we are called to reflect him, then that should be our mission too. Yes, yeah. Yeah, listen, you guys, across our five campuses today, in every lobby, uh, we have some ministry who is represented, uh, some organization that we're working with in the community that has something to do with foster care. So whether it's CASA or it's Kids Hope, you know about Kids Hope? Uh, You know, if you got got one hour a week you could commit, I mean, you, you don't have to start fostering kids tomorrow. But if you got one hour that, that you could commit, uh, we will put you up with a, an at-risk child in the public school. Uh, that's what Kids Hope is all about. And they are looking for those mentors who will give an hour, one hour a week. So we've got that. We've got a, a, a new ministry we're working with called Ruth's Project. And here's the beauty of Ruth's Project. Uh, you saw the statistic in the, in the opening video that over 50% of people who start fostering, they quit after a year. And it's because they don't have resources. Mm-hmm. And they find it's, it's a really difficult job to do. So they're getting smothered by the responsibility that they've got. So what Ruth Project does is they come alongside of foster families. And they provide respite care. And they provide a night out so that you as a couple can, you know, can get away from that responsibility for an evening. They provide meals. They provide clothing, a free clothing store. Just so much going on. It's all happening in the lobbies of our five campuses. So I want to encourage you when you leave today, uh, as Tori said earlier, her whole view of God changed because she ran into some godly people who loved her in a way that caused her to say, well, maybe this is what God's like. So we want to be that kind of a church. And that's why these ministries are in your lobby today so, so that you have an opportunity to sign up and participate and what they're doing. I, I do have one last question for you, though, and that is, uh, whenever we do one of these inspiring stories weekends, uh, obviously there's a, there's a topic that we want to drill down into, in your case, foster care. Uh, but at the same time, we want to hear a story of how someone came to faith in Christ. So what, what led them to that place of surrendering their life to Jesus? Because we, we recognize that in a crowd this size and watching online, there are probably a number of people who've never made that decision for themselves. And, and there may be some of those people who are thinking, you know, it's really good you did that, that, because you needed it. You know, I mean, you came from a broken home and there was a mess in your life and whatever. I don't need that, okay? I'm doing pretty well. So I want you to tell our crowd one last time, if you've never surrendered to Jesus, why do you need to do that? I think if you're not broken now, you will be at some point, you know? <laughs> if you're not hurt now, you will be at some point. In the beginning of my book, I talk about how Jesus sleeps through storms. And again, we are called to reflect him. So we too can be storm sleepers, but we can only be storm sleepers when we know Christ. You know, he is this companion. Um, He is this man who dwells within us and gives us the power to to rest through the hardest of hardship. Um, And, you know, at some point, We're going to be kicked out. We're going to be left out. We're going to be abandoned. But God welcomes us into the kingdom of heaven. Like he has a home for us. And there's going to be some point where someone's going to mislabel you, where someone's going to misunderstand you. But God like knows us fully. So even if you're not broken, even if you don't need saved right now, you're going to need saved at some point. And um, I never think, you know, I always think that what better, what better, way, what better time to do it 
than, than now. Yes, yeah. So with that segue, what better time to do it than now? Let me invite you now to, to make that decision for yourself. Mm-hmm. So, you know, here's the Bible in a nutshell, okay? The Bible says every one of us has a tendency to go our way instead of God's way. We do it every day. We're rebels at heart. Okay, God tells us what not to do and we do it anyway. He tells us what we should do and we don't do the things we should do. So we would rather be the king, the queen of our own life. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when you alienate yourself from God like that, when you pull away from the God who is the giver of life, I mean, come on, God's the source of life. What happens when when you unplug from the giver of life? What happens when you pull the the cord of the lamp out of the wall? It dies. Mm -hmm. And scripture says the wages of sin is death. That's the apostle Paul writing in Romans 6, 23. So a life apart from God, you're the walking dead. Spiritually speaking, there's a deadness on the inside. And if that doesn't get fixed, it leads to physical death at the end of this life and eternal death in the world to come. But God loves us so much. He doesn't want you to stay dead. So he sent his son, Jesus. And what Jesus came to do wasn't just to serve as an example. He came to be a sacrifice, to give his life, to take the death we deserve to die. When Jesus was dying on the cross, that's what he was doing. He was taking the death that you and I deserve to die. And he didn't stay dead. He was raised from the dead. And today he lives and he offers forgiveness. He offers a new life. But the key is you got to surrender to him. The key is you got to say, okay, I'm going to stop stop living as a rebel Mm -hmm. and I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus. I'm going to tell Jesus, I want you to be my savior. I want you to be the king of my life. I want to follow, find out what it means to follow you. So I I want to pray what we uh, at Christ Community Church, we call it the surrender prayer. And I'm going to walk you through it quickly and then we're going to sing a closing song and go. But I want you to have the opportunity that Tori was saying, you know, maybe it'd be a good idea if she had heard that You know, that frankly put earlier on. So I'm going to put it real frankly to you right now. Let's bow together in prayer. And if you've never prayed a surrender prayer, there are three really important words in that prayer. And the first important word is sorry. You just got to come to grips with the fact that you've wandered from God. You've unplugged from the giver of life. You've gone your way instead of God's way. And you could see that. Come on, be honest. In your life, you could see how pride or anger or lust or greed, any number of things the Bible calls sins, have broken your relationship with the God of the universe. And he's waiting to hear a genuine, I am really sorry. So if that's how you're feeling this morning, you're ready to say, I'm sorry. It's not just, oh yeah, I'm not perfect. No, 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 no. It's, I am, I'm heartbroken at the way my sinfulness has messed up my life. I'm going to give you just a quiet moment to say sorry to God in your own words. The second important word in this surrender prayer is the word thanks. You know, hopefully you've heard loud and clear today that the reason Jesus came to planet earth was to give his life for you so that you could be adopted into God's family. And if you've never personalized it by saying, thank you, Jesus, for doing that for me. Thank you, though I deserved death, having pulled away from the God of life. You took the death I deserve to die. So again, in your own words, sincerely tell God right now, Jesus, I'm so thankful for what you've done for me. Now, if you've genuinely owned your sin and said sorry, And if you've really thanked God from the bottom of your heart for what Christ has done for you, the final word is the word please. This is where you say, please come into my life now. You know, please take the throne of my life. I don't want to be the ruler anymore. I want you to be the ruler. 
You know, please make my life like Tori's describing. You know, a life that's filled with your word, filled with your people, learning what it means to follow you wholeheartedly. Please become my king today. Would you, would you invite Jesus to come in, not just as your forgiver, but as the new ruler of your life? Please, please come in. God, your word promises that when we seek you with all our heart, you will be found. So you know when it's a sham, you know when it's insincere on our part. But you also know when we're coming to you genuinely broken and saying, I need a savior, I need a king, I need Jesus. And so I pray that you would answer that prayer. Many hearts today, God, for those in one of our five auditoriums or watching online who have prayed that surrender prayer, May the Spirit of God come to live on the inside as you've promised and begin to make them new people from the inside out. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that surrender prayer, you know, there's hardly a week that goes by that uh, people aren't praying that surrender prayer at Christ Community Church. And so we like to help you get started in a new, a fresh relationship with Christ. So we put together a pack of information. We call it the First Steps Pack. It's got a New Testament in it that tells the story of Jesus. Got a little study guide in it. You'll see a picture of it there on the screen. And it's available for you. It's at the back of every section where you're seated. Back of every section, there is a table. And on the table are First Steps packets. So if you prayed that surrender prayer, you meant it from your heart, uh, our gift to you is yeah, just pick up one of those packets on your way out. If you've already made that decision, Don't pick up a packet just because you're curious to see what's in it. You know, leave it for those who are crossing that line today of genuinely surrendering to Jesus as Savior and King. And by the way, that's a really good way to make that internal decision tangible, to say, yeah, I did it. So tomorrow morning when you wake up and you're wondering, did I really do that? Yeah, I I actually came home with that information. And uh, begin to go through it and find out what a relationship, a day-by-day walk with Christ is all about. Now, before we uh, stand to sing a closing song, how about joining me in thanking our guest, Tori O'Peterson. Peterson.